Well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's good to be out on a nice uh, brisk Sunday morning and thankful for everybody that chose to join us in God's house today. I want to start out with a, uh, just with a verse of scripture. It is the uh, 95th Psalm and it kind of points to our beginning today musically as we come to uh, worship the Lord. Uh, uh, Psalm 95 verses uh, 1 and 2 says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and in song. For the Lord is great and the great king above all gods. Amen, church? Amen. Good way to start. Stand to your feet as we sing just a couple of songs. Uh, start out with a beautiful hymn of the church. Praise him, praise him. I always encourage you, and I'll do it again, to sing the words from your heart. And to the Lord this morning. Let's sing together, everyone. with us, Father. We want to praise you today, Lord. We want to praise the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, who truly reigneth forever and ever and ever, Lord. And what a privilege it is to gather in this place this day in the name of Christ, Lord, knowing that your Spirit is among us. Father, right now we just give this time to you. Lord, we want to be yielded to you, Lord. We want to, Lord, just uh, I'll let you do through your spirit and your word what it is that you desire to accomplish today. And Lord, anything that would hinder that, be it flesh or spirit, we speak against that now in Christ's holy name. Lord, the name that's above all names, Father, the power and the authority of Christ. Lord, we pray it rules and reigns in this place right now in this time. We yield ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing with us again. A beautiful song of worship just simply says... I love you, Lord. Sing it. Sing it to the Lord this morning, friends. From your hearts is my encouragement to you today.
just uh, very quickly. Someone has a word of praise for the Lord this morning. Anybody in the house? Anybody? Amen. Amen, sister. Communicated with Brother Franklin this morning. They're very thankful for this for the surgery this week going well for Sister Frances, and she's doing very, very well. They've gone today to uh, see Matthew, their grandson, be uh, ordained as a deacon, so they couldn't be here. But uh, they're filled with thanks and praise. Others this morning, just a word of thanks for the Lord. Yes, brother. Yes, for another beautiful day in Winnipeg. Amen. Someone else, anybody? Sharing the sweet storm. Amen. Absolutely. Pray for those that are still experiencing that. Someone else, anyone? How about a... Amen. Amen. No doubt about it. Absolutely. Yes, sister. Amen. Thank God for loving me. That's a good testimony. Others in the house this morning. Yes, buddy. Yes, absolutely. That is a praise. Someone else? Anyone? Prayer request. Just maybe call out a name or uh, briefly share. Big pardon? Leslie, Leslie Edwards, yes. Others this morning. Safe travels for Mary and James and Louise as they travel to Aruba. Do that, absolutely. Nancy. Absolutely, brother, certainly. Mark. Yes. Others in the house this day. Brother Greg, I want you to remember my little boy. They found out he's got 99% cancer, and he's been tested. He'll be having surgery Monday and Tuesday. Absolutely. Yes, Crandall, hit replacement. Yes, Tuesday, yes. Thank you, my brother. Others. Lifting up a hand this morning. Amen. You know, we're going to sing a song, and, um, and, I, and I love this song. It's a, it's a great song of encouragement to me. It's called Something Beautiful, Something Good. And as the song is uh, being, uh, as we sing the song unto the Lord, we just want to open up the altar to just, if you feel led just to come and pray today, come and pray. The Spirit of God leads you this way, come and pray. And, and if nothing else, give God thanks and praise for the fact that He can take our lives and uh, uh, in our brokenness and He can make something beautiful out of it today. And I just felt on my spirit, if you, if you sense today that there's struggle in your life, there's things that are, are just really working against you, and then you, even there's failure there and things that, that burden your spirit, just know today that God can take the biggest mess and make something absolutely beautiful and gorgeous out of that. And he can work in our lives to, to rearrange things in ways we probably never fathomed or dreamed. And he can get glory out of that. So just meditate on that. And as we sing this song, the altar's open. Let the Spirit lead you in, in worship and prayer and meditation. And we'll just seek the face of the Lord together right now. Let's sing. I'll just bow and let's pray together. The altar's open again. If you feel led to come and pray right now or maybe gather around some of those that are here to pray, seeking the face of the Lord together, just come as God's Spirit leads you, friends. thankful just for your sweet presence and Lord just for the uh, <clears throat> uh, the knowing that the spirit is among us Lord both by 
the promises of your word and the reality of what we sense in our own spirits. Lord, we thank you for that. And Father, we just want to pray, Lord, now specifically for everyone who's come to seek your face. Uh, for whatever reason it might be, whatever burdens on their heart, whatever desire, Lord, that they're approaching you with, Lord, whatever word of praise or thanks, Father, we just come alongside that now in Jesus' name. And Lord, we just pray as they reach out to you, Lord, that first of all, you just minister to them by your spirit. Let them be strengthened and encouraged, Lord, by knowing that you're God and you're in control. And Lord, we can come to you and yield our lives to you and put our lives in your, in your hands, Lord, and know, Father, that you're there. You're guiding, you're guarding, you're protecting. You're working out your plan in accordance with your will and grace. And we just take great comfort in that, Lord. Surely we do. For those that come, Lord, and those standing, uh, Lord, seeking you for, for physical healings, physical touch, Lord, we just pray for that. Lord, we believe that truly you are still a great healing God. We've seen that power, Lord, manifested in our own lives and the lives of many. So we look to you for that, Lord. We thank you as we often pray for doctors and hospitals and things such as that. But, Lord, we know that they treat, but you heal. So, Father, we just pray for that healing power to be manifested, Lord, in, in circumstances and situations, even this day as these prayers are being lifted in faith. We pray for your strength, Lord, and for your grace, even in the difficult times, to, uh, Lord, face them knowing that we walk in a position of victory in the Spirit. Lord, without regard to what's going on in the natural, that as sons and daughters of you, the Most High God, Lord, we know who we are. And Lord, we know that we get our strength from you. And Lord, that will sustain us in all things, Lord. We pray for that strengthening as well today. For the peace that passeth understanding to guard hearts and minds, Lord. For those that, uh, Lord, seeking in, in, in the way of other sorts of needs, Father, or whatever they may be, mind, body, soul, spirit, we just pray for, uh, Lord, uh, in faith, believing and receiving. Uh, for these things, Father, to be brought about in the lives of those who seek you. Lord, again, we know you're a God that's ever-present. You're a God that's all-powerful. And, Lord, a God that uh, touches and moves, and we thank you for that. Lord, I pray for those today that might be having struggles in their life, facing difficult circumstances, things that, Lord, weigh them down, that perplex their minds. And I just pray for them, Lord, just to be strengthened today, to be encouraged, Lord, to know that, uh, Father, as we walk according to your will and your way, we can stand upon the promises of your word, which says, Father, you'll work out all things, Lord, ultimately for our good and for your glory. And so, Father, we just pray they be encouraged today. They be strengthened. Again, they experience that peace, Lord. They experience clarity of wisdom and discernment as they move forward. And, Lord, as you guide their paths and, Lord, lead them step by step, Lord. That's our prayer. And they would just sense that and know that and leave, Father, even this prayer time with confidence. Lord, with confidence and boldness. Lord, in living life under the direction of the Holy Spirit. And, Lord, in knowing again that you are in control of all things. And we thank you for that, Lord. Lift burdens is our prayer and encourage minds and spirits. But Lord, truly, uh, as Christ walked the earth, he experienced uh, uh, the things that uh, we experience in life today, Lord. The, uh, the heartache, the disappointments, the discouragement, the challenges. And Lord, truly, as the word says, he, having been made in the form of a man, walking as a human, Lord, now is in a position to bring comfort and peace and encouragement and help to us who find ourselves in that way now. So, Father, we just thank you for that, Lord, and appreciate even what you're doing and accomplishing right now in this time and in this place, Lord. Oh, we give you thanks and praise. Continue to lead, Lord, in this time together. May we truly be yielded to you, Lord, not just in this place, but, Lord, in every, every place in our lives and every day of our lives, Lord, that's our desire. Thank you, Father. We pray it all and count it done now. In Jesus' holy name, amen.
doing as good as she can. Hopefully, next week we'll be doing her home. We're very fortunate to have a good family. Most of you know them. scattered from Oregon to Virginia to here. But when something happens, everybody gets together. How many more a few minutes? Weeks ago, Cheryl's here. Kirk's coming in Friday. <coughs> I have to look at my daughter because I can't keep all this mess straight. spirits. Um, her color is back because they um, did transfusions. She can walk and talk and do everything. We're very thankful for that. But the doctors have said, get everybody together. Amen. Thank you uh, for sharing your heart, brother. And we know your heart and uh, your love, and we certainly know Miss Nancy's heart for sure. And and where her love and her faith lies. And we're going to stand alongside one another in prayer, and stand alongside you and your family, brother. And you make us aware of what we can do to to encourage and to help you. Fair enough. That's our that's our heart for sure. So so be be much in prayer, friends. And we know that uh, we know that you will. We know that you will. Again, want to welcome everyone to to Bethlehem today. It is good to be in, in a nice warm place just to worship and to, to encourage one another and to be part of God's family. I believe God intends for all, and my brother spoke about a family, I believe God intends for all his children to be part of a church family. I believe that, to come together and encourage one another and to, uh, to challenge one another when the need may be. So thank you for coming here to join our family today and be part of, uh, be part of what God is doing here. God bless you, each and every one. Trust you'll look at your bulletin and see the announcements. And I'll say if you have something to share with us, uh, if you go ahead and move to the front just for the sake of efficiency of time so we can move through. I just want to mention a couple of things uh, specifically tonight at uh, 6 p.m. We'll uh, celebrate communion and the washing of the saints' feet. It's a very special time of worship. And, uh, you know, when Jesus did this uh, on the night of his betrayal. He put it forward in a way, he said, when you partake. And I believe it is a special opportunity as well as a calling of God uh, for his children, uh, those who have faith in Christ, to come together to celebrate this as a way of focusing and remembering and expressing the esteem in which we hold the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I encourage you, Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is for believers to come participate. And uh, if that's something that you're not familiar with, I'll be glad to chat with you about that, help you understand uh, the ins and outs. And so come and do that also in the washing of the saints' feet after the model of Christ on that same night uh, that he was betrayed. And it's just a really uh, way, uh, way to express 
our humility before God and others, and our commitment to serve both God and others. So uh, make note of that, and please uh, join us tonight. I want to mention, as you see in the bulletin, uh, the, uh, those of you who have signed up and plan on participating in our Bible study, study series. It's called the Pathways Bible Study Method. Uh, we're beginning those on Sunday, February the 7th at uh, 4 in the afternoon. Those will run about an hour each session. And uh, there will be probably five, six sessions total. We'll begin on that Sunday afternoon. I encourage you to come. It's not too late. Let me know. I've ordered the books. And uh, for those of you that are participating, what I need you to do uh, in, in preparation today is begin to study the book of 1 Thessalonians. This teaching on how to study the Word will involve a study of 1 Thessalonians. I encourage you to begin to read that and to study that. That will be kind of key and central to the whole study series. So uh, I encourage you again to take, uh, to take advantage of that. Uh, take advantage of that if you would, my friends. Um, also, I uh, want to say thanks to those who contributed to the effort to, for us to participate in the stand-down event. Uh, not too late to volunteer for that. If you have any questions, we'll be glad to uh, speak to you uh, speak to you about that. I was also asked to announce that today, uh, from 3 until 5, uh, the GLAD Matters. I get that right? We'll be getting together. And those of you participating in the MAT uh, pro or, uh, project will know about that. This afternoon, 3 to 5, in the activity building. I bet my brother here has something to share, so I'll uh, yield the floor to him. Come on up, pal. Thank you, pal. Okay, I need to make one quick uh, announcement. Uh, we need to update our usher team. Uh, I'm leading the usher team this year and next year, and we could use a couple more ushers and some alternates. So if you're interested in helping out, please fill out this portion right here with your name on it and uh, turn it into the offering plate and we'll meet next uh, Sunday morning at the church. Also, we're starting a greater team, uh, especially we want women to encourage women to come and join us and greeting people as they come in. And Susan's in charge of that. So again, uh, put your name on this form if you're interested in uh, being a greater and we sure would appreciate uh, your help in this. Thank you. Also, the uh, senior ministry is Thursday night. Yes, senior ministry is uh, six o'clock Thursday night. We do have junior church today, and we're trying something new, so I'm going to experiment on y'all. I also asked to read this. Uh, ladies, the Women of Joy trip. Uh, today is the last day to let Diane know if you're going. Even, even if you don't have your deposit today, please see her after church if you want to participate in the upcoming trip to the Women of Joy conference. Anybody else? Anything at all, friends? Anything at all? All right, very good. That being said, friends, we'll ask our ushers to, uh, to come forward as we just enter this time of worship, as we just reverently worship the Lord, and as we uh, worship in the way of giving our tithes and our offerings. Gentlemen, if y'all will come forward. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this beautiful day, this wonderful opportunity to gather together in, in this place to worship and praise you. Father, we ask that you bless this offering we're about to receive, that it may be used in a manner that's pleasing to you to further your work. In your name I pray. Amen.
One thing, back to the announcements, I apologize. I did fail to uh, emphasize this. I really wanted to. There's a note in your bulletin today. It says, in order to ensure the safety of our babies and our toddlers who are in the nursery, we ask that no one enter the nursery except parents with a child who's there or the assigned nursery workers. And this includes sometimes we have the habit of cutting through the nursery to get from one side of the building to the other during service, maybe with the back restrooms. We really need to avoid that. Now, the toddlers are on the floor moving about and could be near the door for a moment, and uh, we just want to make sure that uh, everybody is safe and well taken care of. So we ask no one in the nursery except the nursery workers assigned for that day and parents who might be there dropping off or picking up their kids, just for the safety. That being said, we ask you to stand up and move around, greet one another, choir will be coming forward, and we'll continue with worship in that way. Carry on, friends. You know, we have had a solemn time here this morning as we have concerns and cares for our family and loved ones on our hearts. And if we dwell on that, it, it can, can get us down. But I, I want you to listen to the words that the choir is going to sing and put things in perspective for what's ahead. Let's listen to the words. Going past the moon, the stars and the planets, I'm going to walk on the Milky White Way. When old Gabriel gives a signal, I'm going to leave for heaven to say.
Give him a hand, guys. Isn't he cool? Amen. Yeah. Love it. Absolutely. Thank God for those that go and those that go to care for them. Anyway, we're going to continue on this morning uh, with our series as we've been talking about the daily walk, daily discipleship of Christ, emphasizing the fact that it's uh, uh, truly meant to be a daily, uh, moment-by-moment -moment thing to, uh, to know the Lord and walk with the Lord. Let's, let's pray over this time right now, and then we'll uh, dive into God's Word. Lord, thank you so much for your Word. Thank you, Father, for the chance to come just to think through it and to think about it and to ponder, uh, Lord, what it says, and to let it be that tool that the Spirit will use right now to speak into our hearts, Lord. And, and we pray you do that. Lord, as we teach, as we preach, Lord, we just pray that you accomplish your, word, or your will, rather. Uh, we know there's nothing that we can do on our own. But, Father, we believe, Lord, Lord, through the Spirit, that much can be accomplished here in this time and this place. So we yield to you, and, Lord, we sincerely and earnestly seek, uh, Lord, the move of your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You've been with us at all, friends. You know we've been moving through as part of our overall series uh, about discipleship, moving through uh, what's referred to as the Beatitudes. We're going to take a quick look eventually at, in the entire, or at the entire Sermon on the Mount, if you will. And we introduced that a number of weeks ago. We've been working through them one by one by one, looking at those daily dispositions of a, of a believer, of a disciple of Jesus Christ. And we worked our way down to, uh, uh, to being pure in heart, what it means to be pure in heart. And I kind of thought it was interesting uh, to be talking about purity of heart in the middle of the election season. Amen, church. Yeah. You know, that's one thing, that's one thing that we uh, uh, tend to uh, have a question mark about is the purity of heart sometimes of politicians. Not all politicians. Now, there may be any politicians here today. That's good. Anyway, no, I'm just kidding with you. No. All of us are probably politicians to some degree. But, you know, I don't mean to sound cynical. And I apologize for that, but we do recognize that sometimes people in the process of trying to get elected might tend to say what needs to be said to accomplish that goal. Amen? You believe that. We, we know that happens. Uh, uh, you know, they say what they need to. They choose positions on certain issues based on the polls as opposed maybe to based on personal conviction. Do you think that ever happens? You know, they, they follow the poll numbers. This is where the crowd's at. This is where the votes are. Uh, so we'll go that way. And uh, uh, sometimes we believe their external behavior, the rhetoric they use, you know, may or may not be reflected of an inward conviction or inward uh, legitimacy, if you will, of, uh, of conviction about what they're saying. And, and, you know, that's one reason we don't like politicians in general. Is that correct? I mean, that's one reason we, we hear what they say and we kind of cock our heads and say, yes, you're right, you know. And, and the reality is, you know, we sometimes participate in the game. We hear them say things uh, are meant to, 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 uh, to apply to us as maybe as evangelical conservative Christians, whatever. And maybe even if we question what they mean by that or if they really mean it, we still go that way because we know that's the way the game's played. To get enough about politics. Today, though, we're going to look at something a bit more personal to all of us, if you will. And we'll look again at Matthew chapter 5, our verse of Scripture for today. Matthew chapter 5 in verse 8. Uh, it says, blessed, oh, that's the wrong slide, brother. I forgot to change that. I'm sorry. That is my, don't pay attention to that. Look in your Bible. I, I forgot to update the slides, brother. That's my fault. Verse 8 reads, I guarantee, verse 8 reads this. It says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart. Those who are inwardly sincere, having a genuine loyalty to God, possessing godly motives, not just an external religion or self-serving actions. Those that are pure in heart. You know, we talked about the Sermon on the Mount uh, really was all about having that inward, genuine relationship with the Lord that is expressed outwardly. When we think about what is said thus far, about being poor in spirit, one who could be touched by mourning, one who is meek, one who has a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. Last week, talking about those that are merciful. Begin to see a genuine, heartfelt devotion to God and the things of God and a desire. That's okay, brother. That's okay. And a desire to, uh, to serve Him. And, and, and again, to, to have that genuineness of spirit is so very, very important, that genuineness of heart. You know, we also said in the, in the, in the teaching here that Jesus is given the Sermon on the Mount, he's, he's also directly refuting 
the example and the teaching of the Pharisees. And we know the Pharisees who, who come along and they're full of pomp and circumstances and outward righteousness. But Jesus pretty much continually and quite often and sometimes quite harshly rebukes them for their hypocrisy. And we know in the Beatitudes, in the Sermon on the Mount, there's many things there that, uh, uh, that Jesus has given as illustrations. He uses a series of examples, starting that by, You have heard that it was said, but I tell you. We talked about that when we introduced this, where Jesus said, You know, you've heard this kind of teaching, you've seen this kind of behavior, but I'm telling you something different. As he refutes the hypocrisy of the self-serving Pharisees. Uh, let me just read this to you. Matthew 23. I mean, he stung them, guys. In Matthew 23 and 23, he said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Uh, he says, You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, in faithfulness, you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. In other words, you know, these guys were so astute in their keeping of the rules and the rituals of the old covenant, they literally, the spices, they sprinkled on their food. They set aside a tenth of that for the Lord. They tithe of that. It would be like us taking our salt and pepper at the dinner table and setting aside a tenth and somehow offering it to the Lord. They, they, were, that, they were that externally focused on following the rules, but yet... They neglected the things of the heart. Here, use the illustration of justice, mercy, faithfulness. He says, woe to you. He says, you strain out a gnat and you swallow a camel. A, a gnat was, uh, was an unclean animal in the Old Testament uh, rules and rituals. The law handed down by Moses. So they literally strained what they drank to make sure they didn't inadvertently consume a gnat because the gnat was considered unclean. He says, you, you strain out gnats, you look at these fine dictates of the ritualistic law, but in reality, you swallow a camel, which was also an unclean animal, speaking figuratively of their gross disobedience to the heart of God in what he really wanted from them, an inward desire for holiness that was reflected in an outward life that regarded God. But, you know, today we know that sincere lovers of God, as I believe we are here today, that sincere lovers of God cry out as David did in Psalm 51 and 10. He cried out to the Lord. He says, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Create within me a pure heart was the cry of David. And this is occurring after he has been confronted by the prophet in regard to his moral failure with Bathsheba, you know the story. He desired a pure heart, I believe, and trust and hope today that we all desire a pure heart before the Lord. Well, that's so important. It's the starting point. It's the starting point of a life that pleases God. Now, what is a, a pure heart anyway? We talked about that a little bit while ago. Let's think about that as we sort of break down this verse. What is a pure heart? Now, the word pure is pretty easy to define. We understand pure, right? Um, you know, clean, free from corruption. A uh, heart is innocent in its, in its desires and its motives in line with God's purposes. Pure is pretty easy to wrap our brain around, right? We, we, we can conceive that. But then, what does it mean, a pure heart? I mean, a heart. What is our heart? I mean, we know about the boom, boom, the, uh, the physical heart. We understand that. But what does it mean by a heart? In biblical vernacular, in biblical language, biblical teaching, what is the heart anyway? What does that line up with? It's a little more challenging to define. You know, I, I read what I wrote here. People often ask and, and try to figure out all the parts in the aspect of a person. You know, uh, the Bible speaks of our body, our soul, our spirit, our heart, our mind, our conscious, and probably some other things I didn't think of. And does that mean that we have six or more different parts uh, are some of these terms maybe interchangeable? Uh, is our spirit and soul really the same thing? Is it two different names for the same part of us? How about soul and mind? How about heart and spirit? Are these different labels for the same aspect of people? If we could separate ourselves into this and that and this and that and the other of what we are, how many, how many different parts would there be? 
It's interesting to think about. If you study God's Word, you're drawn to consider these things. And, but let me give you today that the question has been discussed and debated for centuries, and guess what? It's going to continue to be discussed and debated, I believe, till Jesus comes. Uh, biblically, it could be argued different ways. But the bottom line is this. Now, hear me here. The bottom line for this, if you get confused about this as you ponder and read behind different people with different explanations, I don't know that it's critical that we really nail down how many parts we have or what they look like or what their function is. I really don't know that it's important that we figure out if we have six parts or four or three or two or whatever. But what's important is what Jesus taught us. That we love our Lord, our God, with our heart, mind, body, soul, strength. Every aspect of who we are. That part I can wrap my brain around. Even if I don't know the individual parts, I can wrap my brain around God calling me, Jesus calling me to love him with everything I have inside and out, friends. That kind of sums it all up. And that's the most important thing that we can walk away with today. Now, just to look at it very quickly, because we've never had a chance to talk about this, we do know that there are different aspects to who we are. First of all, certainly, is our body. Right? The, the outward part, that's easy to see. Flesh, blood, bone, organs, that kind of thing. We understand our bodies, and, and certainly we know that our bodies are just sort of something that houses the more important aspects of who we are. Certainly we know we have, we have a mind. And, and by the mind, I mean our conscious thought and our awareness and re reason. And other aspects of our mind certainly is, is our emotions and attitude that spring up from our mind. And we know that, that our mind is tainted by the sin nature. We understand that. Jesus, or rather Paul, taught us in the Word to renew our minds, right? That we might be not conformers to the world, but conformers to the image of Christ. We know we have this mind, and we know our mind and our thinking is impacted by its environment, it's impacted by its training, it's impacted by a lot of things in our lives, our, our thinking, our faculties of reason, and our faculties of rationalizing things, and being aware of what's going on around us and reacting. And then certainly we know, without a doubt, that within us deeper is our spirit, is our spirit, is the very core of our being, it's our most inward part, it, it gives life. You know, when the Bible says that, that God breathed into Adam the breath of life, I believe he imparted to him a spirit, and whoom, he became a living soul. And then we know that when the spirit leaves the body, that's death. That when God calls that spirit out, the body loses its animation, and it ceases to live. It's a very much a God part of who we are. We know as believers, our spirit is recreated in Christ. We also believe that our spirit... For the believer is in fellowship with the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. That down, down there deep is where the Holy Spirit is ministering to our spirit. And from that, the leadership of the Lord surfaces and rises up through mind and ultimately into body. We also know that sometimes our spirit can be in struggle with our mind. Amen. That uh, there can be a challenge. I, I see this mind aspect of who you are many times as a battleground, as a bridge between spirit and Embody, if you will. And we see a lot of things happening there that we know can give us difficulty. Now, where's the soul in all that? You know, we've got the mind, the body, the spirit. Where's the soul in all that? It's going to depend on who you ask, friend. Some are going to say uh, that the soul is the mind realm. Some are going to say that the soul is synonymous with the spirit. Doug's going to say that he don't know. Okay? I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know for sure. I know, I know kind of what I think. And, and beyond so, where, where's the heart at? What does it mean when he says heart? Is he talking about the mind? Let me fix this tie. Is he talking about the mind? Is he talking about uh, the spirit? When he talks about loving the Lord with all your heart. And you see the other places where heart turns up in the scripture. Well, again, in, in some passages, heart seems to be synonymous with spirit. Some passages, heart seems to be synonymous with mind. Perhaps, I don't know, the heart might be a bridge between the mind and the spirit. I don't really know, but I know this, that within us, we have a heart. And although it's not a literal organ that you can touch and see, it's an aspect of our personality and who we are, from which flows our deepest desires, from which flows our deepest desires. Aspects of our personalities, our reactions, our passions, the things that drive us. It's really the central part in a very real way of who we are. The heart is likewise at the core of our being. And it impacts 
it impacts how we live our lives. I, I kind of think of sometimes like this, and don't go too far with this, it might not hold up, but I think of if you have a car and you've got the body of the car, you see with the eye, you've got the engine there, which is kind of like the mind that drives the thing, the gasoline, sort of synonymous with our heart. Because you put good gas in an engine, it works well. If you've got a good heart, things work well. If you put bad gas in an engine, it spits, it sputters, it behaves poorly and functions not so well. And a bad heart results in that kind of life. So we see the heart, the source of our emotions, our true intentions are there. And scriptures speak to that sort of thing. It's very important for Luke 6.44 says that a tree is recognized by its own fruit. It goes on to teach in verse 45. Listen now, a good man or woman brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings up evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So the heart is important in dictating of the things that express themselves outwardly in our lives. Jesus talked about some pretty hard things that come out of the heart. Matthew 15, 19, Jesus says, Out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. So we know the heart is tainted. It's tainted by sin. And a lot of part, of, you know, even in the previous verse, it's you know, about storing up things in our heart that they would come out good in our life. How important it is we think about our heart, our inward desires, our inward attention. Now, many heart issues are a little more subtle than the things I just mentioned that Jesus quoted. There's many other subtleties that slip into our heart and slip out in our lives. And even as believers, some of the things that we might could identify might be being motivated by pride. Amen, church? By being motivated by, by pride, even in service to the Lord, pride and, and personal achievements. Sometimes, if we're not careful, begin to push themselves ahead of serving God for the glory of God. We've got to guard against that. And I believe that's an affair and an event of the heart when that begins to occur. Even when we deal with people, even in ministry, again, pride, personal achievement, personal recognition, self-interest. If we're not careful, can can flow out of our heart if it's not where it needs to be and not properly dealt with and begin to take front stage. Personal gain. I've had people tell me they went to a certain church because it was good for their business. Uh, people tell me, they have confessed that to me. Sometimes that we do things that uh, even in ministry perhaps that are expedient for us and good for our own personal gain. And, and even in, in using our gifts and our talents. Uh, you know, instead of ministry, using your gift or talent could become a great chance for you to perform. Amen? I mean, you know, you, perhaps you have a great talent, whatever it might be. And, 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 we, and, and sometimes it's easy, if we're not careful, for those motives, our heart to become impure. And we begin to do things, quote, unquote, for the Lord when really doing it for self-glorification. It can happen. We've got to guard against such things. That's the human condition. That's the, the aspect of our sin-tainted heart we've got to guard against and be careful, careful of. Oh, we've got to be so careful. We've got to be careful. Other subtleties occur. Um, have you ever heard a prayer request that maybe sound a little bit like gossip? You know? You've got to be careful of those things, right? Yeah. You know, or, or maybe, you know, I need to share with you something about so-and-so. And, 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 and maybe it's done in the name of the Lord, but in reality, it's just a good way to talk about somebody. It happens. You think it might happen? I'm pretty sure it might happen, friends. We've got, we got to be careful, or, uh, you know, that we're pure in motive, pure in heart. For, again, the text reads, blessed are the pure in heart. It says, for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, let's put, that, put it in context now, because <clears throat> if we look at that, we might say, ruh row, I have a challenge sometimes with my heart. It ain't always as pure as it ought to be, and I recognize that. Does that mean I'm not going to see God? Well, let's think about this thing, and this is important to teach this in context. Okay. Um, what does it mean we'll see God? What does that mean, see? Well, you know, the reality is everybody's going to see God. Everybody. On the day of judgment, you know, the Bible teaches that everybody's going to see God. When I hear it says to appear in heart to see God, but well, we know those who are overt sinners who totally disregard Jesus Christ are going to show up before God one day. They're going to see him. What does he mean they're going to see God? 
I, I take it to mean I take it to mean more than just see with the visible thing. I think it means means more than that. Like I walk up to my sister here and she's holding her pen. I say, let me see that. What does she do? She'll hand it to me. Or I can see it from here. But if I walk up and say, let me see that, you inherently begin to hand it to me. I believe, I believe you're speaking of those who have that purity of heart, that sincerity of spirit. They're going to see God not just visually. They're going to experience God and be welcomed into his presence. God, in his word, uses the word see kind of like that. As an illustration to help us understand what's being said here, in, in John chapter 3, Jesus is encountering uh, Nicodemus, and Jesus replied, Verily, truly, I say to you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. A couple of verses later, in verse 5, Jesus answers, Verily, true, Very truly, I say to you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the Spirit. And he seems to be using the word see, uh, synonymous with the word enter, synonymous with how we would think of the word see many times as participating, taking hold of, being in the presence of. So I believe that to see here means uh, the pure in heart, those that will, that will enter the fellowship with the Lord. They will see God more than just with their eyes. They will experience Him. And in this context, remember, he's refuting uh, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees who, who, who outwardly are very pure and holy and righteous, but inwardly they're nothing like that. They're not pure in heart. And although they will see God at judgment, lest they change, they will never enter into his kingdom to see God in that sense. Also remember the time in here. This is pre-Calvary. This is pre-crucifixion. We know that we're not saved by our works or by our deeds or by our acts or even the attributes of our spirit. We're saved through genuine repentance of sin and receiving Christ by faith. That's what brings salvation. That is by grace we are saved, not by necessarily the attitude of our heart per se. And we believe our spirit is made pure and holy in Christ. We've talked about that, but our heart we still have challenges by. But we know that it takes a pure heart even to want to approach God. It takes a heart that's motivated by purity to desire salvation and redemption and forgiveness. So given that I'm saved by grace, given that I'm saved by my faith in Jesus Christ, does that mean that for me to strive for a pure heart on a regular daily basis is something I can kind of overlook is no big deal? Well, no, a thousand times no. This is a teaching and a command of Jesus Christ. This is the next expectation of God in my life. And, and to seek a pure heart, again, is the foundation of my repentance to begin with in salvation and certainly carries over into my daily life day by day. This attitude will carry over into my walk with the Lord, to have a pure heart, pure in its motive, pure in its desire to please God, pure in walking holy before the God that I love. Well, you know, the cool thing here, and let's start to bring this thing home a little bit, the cute, cool thing is God has given us, listen now, God has not told us to go out and have a pure heart and not equipped us to accomplish that goal. You see, that's what God does. When God tells us to do something, God provides the means whereby which to accomplish that. I am so thankful for the Lord for doing things in such a manner. He's given us, he's given us certain forces, certain things that we can grab hold of and utilize, tools, if you will, that will both help us to discern our heart, and then they will direct our heart. The first things that help us first discern, the first thing to discern means to, to assess something, to, to determine precisely what is going on, to look closely at, to inspect thoroughly, to sort out and see just what is what is what it means to discern. To discern our heart means to judge, listen to me, to judge, to judge our own motives. Amen? To look at ourselves and to be sure that we are living with purity of heart in the sense in the purity of our motives. And the purity of our standing before the Lord? Oh, so it's important for us to discern, and we have these things we'll speak of in a moment to help us to do that, to determine our true intention, decide if we are pure or otherwise fall into something else, to figure out if there's some change that needs to happen even within our heart for us to meet the call of Christ, to live with a pure, pure heart. Have you ever caught yourself not having a pure heart? I have. 
Amen. I have. Yes, I have. You ever caught yourself maybe doing something and you had to step back? Wait a minute. Am I doing that for the right reason? Am I motivated by love for God and others? Or, or something else from the flesh creeping in that caused me to want to go and do this? Is it a personal thing or is it a God thing? It's good, friend. I'm telling you, it's good to routinely discern your heart. And not only God has given us some things to help us discern our heart, to judge them, if you will. He's also given us some really cool things to help direct our hearts in the right direction, to provide, to provide, again, a revelation of the right path that we could go. It's, it's, the, it's the standard Sunday school stuff, amen? It's the same stuff you've heard about, and bless God, you're fixing to hear about it again because it's so important, it's so vital. It's the same stuff, friends. What's the first thing God has given us to discern and direct our hearts? It's His Word. It's His Word. I love Hebrews 4 and 12. It says, For the Word of God is alive and it's active and it's sharper than a double-edged sword and it penetrates even, now listen now, even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. The Word of God gets in there and it's able to help us to see the different aspects of who we are. Now, listen to what it says now. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. That's the power of the Word of God in the life of the believer. It's to help us to discern the attitudes and the thoughts of our hearts. To see them through the eyes of God and to see if they are what God would have them to be. You know, you've heard me say this before. I'll say it again. And, and looking in the Word of God is like looking in a mirror. Amen. And you get up in the morning, you look in the mirror, and there it is. And to quote the old Clint Eastwood movie, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It is right there. You know, and it is what it is. When you look and see, the mirror doesn't what, friends? The mirror doesn't lie. And neither does the Word of God lie. But it speaks truth. And it helps us to see, is our heart God's heart? Or is something else slipped in there and driving who we are? Is it the motive of purity that makes us do the things we do? Again, certainly the word like in a mirror, we see it. It just reveals who we are. And, and, <clears throat> and it's certainly true in regard to the thoughts and attitudes of our hearts. You know, even if our attitudes and our inward thoughts are secluded and concealed from others, they're not concealed from God. And they're certainly not concealed from God's Word. They're revealed by that. Even if we make excuses for ourselves. If you're not even made excuses for yourself, yes, Lord, I've got a right to feel that way. Uh, you know, or something like that. Uh, 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 you know, we, can, we, we, we make excuses for ourselves and, and we kind of we whitewash the truth. Even about why we do what we do. Even about how we serve. Even about whatever. <clears throat> I've never known the Word of God to whitewash anything. It lays bare. It opens. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. It's a good, good thing. Because in honest looks comes honest gain. In being what it is God would have us to be. Psalm 86, 11, the psalmist says, Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I love, I love the Psalm 119. <clears throat> Verse 9, picking up there, says, How can a young person, or an older folk, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? It answers the question by saying, By living according to your word. Verse 10 says, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not walk, friends, sin against you. We talk about it, we talk about it, we talk about it, and we teach you how to study it, and we preach it because it is a vital, it is vital, friends, that this be something we hide in our hearts, that we might walk in every aspect, 
before the Lord as he pleases, as pleases him, but certainly in the purity of our heart. Cannot overstate the power of the word, the necessity of the word, and the compelling nature to be reading and studying God's word to discern and direct our heart. Also, we know that God gave us another Another, another powerful force to help us discern and direct is the Holy Spirit. I told you it's basic Sunday school stuff this morning, friends. And the Holy Spirit comes in and, and he convicts us of our sin. And, you know, and, and, and keep in mind, he, he doesn't, comes in to convict. He doesn't come in to condemn. Don't you glad of that? Con- condemnation, Saint, listen to me now. Let's get it straight one more time, friends. You know, you, you, you've got something you're challenged with in your life. You've got something that you've yielded to that you know is not holy to the Lord and, and whatever. And, and God's dealing with you. And, and sometimes the devil deals with you at the same time because the devil will come to you with condemnation. The God comes with conviction. Condemnation sounds like this. You're worthless. You're useless. I don't want you anymore. God doesn't love you. Go somewhere and hide. That's condemnation. Conviction says, look, Bubba, I need to deal with this. This is not right. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to point you in the right direction. I love you enough. I want to see you succeed in conquering this. Conviction and condemnation. The Holy Spirit brings conviction. It points us toward the pure. It points us to the Word. It brings up in our spirit, in our mind, in our heart what the Word of God has said as we have studied that and and uses these things to prompt us and, and, and to realize and discern that which is not right with our heart and to point us into the right directions. I put down the Holy Spirit helps us guard the gates. Remember I said if we had a, a gas tank, we put the fuel in, <clears throat> and that fuel kind of function maybe as our heart guiding the function of our minds and hence our bodies. And, and that fuel tank's got a lid. You have to open up thing up to fill it up, whatever, and that kind of stuff and, and whatever. But, but, you know, we have gates. We have gates into our hearts. We have the eye gate and the ear gate. The things that we would look upon, the things that we would allow ourselves to hear, the things we would even ponder on in our own minds, sell into our heart, and they begin to reproduce themselves and to show themselves outwardly. And the Holy Spirit, I, I think he'll help us guard those gates sometimes. He'll say, you don't need to look at that. You don't need to listen to that. You don't need to think on that. Thank God for that Holy Spirit that helps us to guard those gates into our heart, that our heart might be filled with the good things that God spoke of. To come forth. He directs us by leading us into the good things of God. Listen to me. God's word, God's spirit shapes our heart if we allow it. Thirdly, there's, a, there's an opportunity to really see these things work in our lives. I call it the opportunity of earnest prayer and meditation. When we come and we fall before the Lord and we seek him. And I'm not talking about busting into the throne room, laying down a few requests and bolting out like a, uh, like a man ablaze. I'm talking about when you come before the Lord and, and you spend some time in worshiping and seeking him in his face and getting in tune with his spirit and, and just seeking him in his truth and allow him to speak into our hearts and our spirits, our minds. If we have elevated ourselves into a sensitivity of his presence. And I've seen so many times in my own life getting before the Lord in prayer and seeking Him about a matter of great concern, perhaps a matter of great frustration, a matter of great anguish, and just knowing that God even right there at the altar of prayer just shape up my heart. You ever had that experience? Saddle your spirit, shape your heart, draw you to Him. He may very well many times point out the error. You know, we come to God to complain about something or somebody, and First thing we know, God's pointing out, well, you know what? You might want to rethink that thing, Bubba. You might want to look unto yourself before you look unto others. So let me help you look at yourself. I've had that experience in prayer and in meditation with the Lord. And it's a great, great thing. And, 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 and trust today, as you desire to have a pure heart before the Lord, that you'll employ these things into your life to allow God to shape your heart into the place of purity that he intends and wants and desires for it to be so that you can be what he desires you to be. I hope that is truly your desire. You know, I believe sometimes also our heart, that aspect of who we are, can become damaged. You've heard the phrase, a broken heart, and we know that usually means something that's uh, just emotional, whatever, and certainly that can happen, but things can happen they will damage our heart. I believe that. Maybe even wound our spirit. A lot of things happen in life that are hard. Now, I've been blessed. I've never had 
some of the hardships some of you have had. I've never faced the great difficulties that some of you are facing. I, and I know that. But I know, especially from pastoral experience, our spirit or heart can become damaged. I believe there's one other thing that God will do through his word, through his spirit, through prayer. I believe God will heal your heart. Do you believe that? I believe God will heal your heart. I really do. I believe he'll bring healing to your spirit. I, and just like the body can get wounded, the spirit can become wounded, the heart can become wounded. Like our physical heart can have issues, our non-physical heart become damaged. And that damage can manifest itself in a lot of different ways. In hardness of attitude, in, in pulling away, in, in so many ways. Oh, it can just manifest itself. And God doesn't want that for you, friend. I believe that. I believe God wants to heal hearts. I believe God wants to heal hearts. I believe God wants to strengthen spirits. I believe God wants to restore to, to purity and to wholeness. I really believe. You know, when Jesus stood up in the temple one day, he was recording the book of Luke, chapter 4, and they handed him the scroll. And he stood up, and the scroll was from the book of Isaiah, and it was proclaiming in Isaiah, the original text, it was proclaiming the coming of the Messiah. And Jesus stood up, and he, and he read that text, and then he said, this is fulfilled in your eyes this day. He's saying, I'm the one the prophet Isaiah spoke of. And in that, in that reading, there's a phrase, where he came to do what, friends? Heal the brokenhearted. I've had God heal my heart before in that way. I've had him deal with it about its purity. I've had him heal it. I've had him restore. And I'm sure before my days are over, he'll have to do it again. And I thank God that he will. As you stand to your feet and you bow your head and you close your eyes. Stand to your feet, bow your head and close your eyes. <clears throat> A couple of things at this point now. A couple of things. Are you willing to let God examine your heart to, through the Word and through the Spirit, maybe even in this time of prayer and meditation, reveal to you those things that are there that aren't pleasing to Him? And He don't want to beat you up today. He don't want to condemn you and make you feel unloved and unworthy. He wants to, yeah, He may want to convict you. But conviction draws you to God. Condemnation pushes you away. Condemnation comes straight out of hell. It comes straight out of our flesh sometimes. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is going to point out and pull you towards him. Or the things there that you know. Do you need God to heal something in your heart? Heal something in your spirit? So cry out to him today. Cry out to him today. Give it all to him. Allow him to do that work as well within you. Father, use this time to accomplish your purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Susan plays something beautiful, something good. Oh, I love this song. All my confusion he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he made something beautiful out of my life. That's some testimonies in this room this morning. God wants to continue that work of making beautiful things out of broken things. That's what God does. Altar is open if you feel led to come and pray just to seek his face. Altar is open. Come as God's spirit would lead you and God's spirit would guide you. Sense of heaviness in the spirit right now. God's dealing with you, friend. Yield to the Lord right now is the word from the Lord. Yield to him, friend. Yield to him. A sense of heaviness in the spirit. Yield to him, friend. Yield to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Yield to him. Yield to him. Let it go. It's the word from the Lord. Just let it go to him.
Father, we thank you, Lord, that you make us something beautiful and something good. Lord, when there's nothing within us of beauty, there's nothing in us of goodness, but Father, Lord, except through Christ. So we thank you, Lord, that the goodness and the beauty of Christ can shine in our lives and shine through our lives, Lord. Father, help us to have a pure heart before you, Lord, with a desire for that and that alone, Lord, above all things. And before all things, Lord, to love you, to worship you, to serve you, Lord, with purity of heart, intention of spirit, and consecration of our minds to you, Lord. So let it be. Let your word penetrate our spirits and our hearts. And Lord, we we'll thank you for the work that you're going to do and the work you have done, Lord. Thank you. Praise you, Lord. Friends, I just appreciate so much you being here today, and I just encourage you today. Be encouraged in the spirit. Be encouraged in spiritual things. Not to, not to, to give up the fight. Not to, to pull back. But to push forward. Push forward with a renewed mind and spirit and heart. And let God just accomplish the things in you and through you that he so much desires to do. The world needs us all to step up and be the people God's called us to be. And that's that's abundantly clear and abundantly evident. I appreciate your willingness to do just that. Just pray blessings on you this week and in and, and God's favor in all things. And ask my brother Cameron if he would to close us out with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time that we have set aside to spend in your house today, God. And Father, let this message ring clear in our hearts and in our minds and in our souls, God. Father, I, I, I struggle sometimes with trying to reason things out. And Father, I struggle with having a pure heart sometimes, God. Father, I have selfish motives. But God, I'm so thankful that you see past all of those things. And Lord, you're constantly reaching out and nudging and encouraging, saying, return to me. So Father, I pray for that one that may be struggling this morning with hardness of heart, with difficult decisions. God, maybe with just a heaviness about them, God. Lord, I pray that you would provide that peace that goes beyond all understanding, that you would give them that hope, God, where there seems no hope. And God, that you would provide people that will be in their life that will encourage them and build them up. And Lord, when they feel like they can't take another step, God, I pray that you would provide the strength to rise them up, Lord, and help them to realize, God, that you are with them and that you will walk with them. And you will hold them up when they can't walk on their own, God. Father, this message today, I pray that it would change our lives. Your word, Father, transforms us. Help us to apply it, God, for it's useless if we don't put it into action. So God, thank you for the message today. Thank you for each and every one that has come today. I pray that your face shines upon them throughout the week, that they could be a light in this community and in their workplace. Father, wherever they may be, may the love of God shine in and through them. God bless this church, bless this community. Help us to be that tower that we need to be for people to come to, Lord, the hospital that needs to, to speak to the sick and heart. Father, I pray, Lord, that if there's one here that don't know you as Savior, that they would... Make that commitment today, Lord. Father, they could see the deacons, the preacher, myself, any of us, God, and we'll be glad to have that conversation with them. Lord, help us to be mindful of each other throughout the week. Help us to be mindful of those prayer requests that have been petitioned to you. And God, help us to be the kind of people that you desire us to be. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.